when you see your child, you see a beautiful young child, you see a child who's maybe kind, you see a lifetime of memories of them growing up. When a professional coach sees them, we're looking and thinking, what gift has this child got? What talent have they got? What capabilities and attributes have they got? And what passion and drive have they got? And I often think how much of that is coachable. And I think most of it, most of it. I've been lucky to work with Michael Phelps. I've been lucky or unlucky, depending on where we are, to work with the Wallabies, Australian cricket team. Now that we've cleaned our act up, I can say that again. But swimming teams and triathlon teams all over the world, and you work with great people and Olympic champions and world record holders with NRL teams and AFL teams, and you start to try and figure out, is there a thread? Is there something or a group of things that I can identify that I can then share with parents and say, you know, if you see these qualities in your children, or you can help your child develop these qualities, I believe they are fundamental in helping them achieve success. Without doubt, two of the things we've already spoken about, confidence, to help them build confidence. Confidence, particularly when under 10. You know, allow your five-year-old to walk in a shop while you stand there, make sure there's that safety. Allow them to walk in with a dollar and buy a bag of lollies and say thank you, or an ice cream or whatever they want and learn some self-responsibility. Allow kids to try things, do things, make decisions and build that sense of self-belief from a young age because can you imagine Phelps on the blocks or can you imagine an All Black standing there facing up going, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm no good, I shouldn't be here. So building confidence. Building the quality of commitment by working with them every day and Helping them understand what easy way, hard way looks like. You know, the old days when we worked with athletes, it was all about telling and yelling. So a kid would come in to do, I'd be working with a, a young swimmer, a swimmer would come into the end of the pool, and I'd say, do it again. You did this, you did that, that's no good. I haven't done this for days. No, but years ago, that's what we do, was all telling and yelling. Now I say to kids, say, is there another way you could have done that? What are we trying to achieve? And you get them to look inside and get them to start think about ways that they could improve by challenging themselves a little bit more. You know, teaching them what the easy way and the hard way looks like and the consequence of always choosing to do things the easy way and the importance and the cumulative effect of doing things the hard way, the cumulative effect of that makes on living a lifestyle of excellence, which is what we're trying to. Without doubt, some of those core values. So again, guys, another Michael Phelps story. Saw him in training before the pan packs. Saw him work hard, physically brilliant, outstanding technically, but I also saw him pick up dirty towels. I also saw him carry an esky back to the hotel. I also say, heard him say thank you to his coach. I also saw him open door for his teammate. So those core human values, integrity, humility, Sincerity, courage, discipline, respect. You see that flying, them, flying right through all the time. Resilience. All right, I'm going to tell a story because I'm in a school and headmaster, you may or may not relate to this. I was working for a school and we wanted to get better. We were sick and tired of being beaten in cross country. We thought we can do something about this. We don't have the talent, we don't have the number of kids in the school to win the 100 metres on the track. We don't have a swimming pool. We don't have enough students for a, a strong rugby team. But cross country, we can just get down there and train. So we made an announcement to the school body and we sent it home to all the parents. We said, we want to do a better job. The students want to do a better job. And we've decided this year, instead of taking the first 15 to the regional cross country champs, we're going to take the first five. First five across the line will get there because we want to take the best athletes. We want them to fight harder. We want them to come to training, which is now available five mornings a week. And if they come in the first five, they'll be part of the team. Day the cross country comes, one, two, three, four, five across the line. We select our team. We're looking forward to this outstanding performance at regional cross country. And then the phone comes. 
bring it to life. Wayne Goldsmith speaking. Who's this? Mrs. Campbell. Yeah, how can I help you? Tells me that little Johnny had had a bit of a bad run. Had a cold. Didn't run as well as could be expected and came eighth. And they'd really appreciate it if Johnny had been included in the team because he had such a bad run. I said, look, I know your son. He's a great guy. Really, he's trained well, understand completely, sympathise from where you're coming from, but that's a selection policy. We've got athletics coming up in a few months. Let him have a crack at that. Hangs up. Goes to the director of sport. Says the director of sport, same story. Little Johnny, cold, shouldn't get in. Director of sport says, I'll stand with my head coach. I'm not going to, no. First five, we want to improve our standards. We want to build a reputation of excellence at our school. I'm not going to budge. Half an hour later, who's on the phone? Wayne Goldsmith speaking. Yes, Ed Master, how can I help you? Ah, uh, you want me to change the selection policies because if they don't, they're going to leave the school and take 20000 worth of fees. And if I don't, I'll be looking for a new job. Okay, no problem, sure. So we let little Johnny in. Four weeks later, we go to regional cross-country championships with an extra 17 kids. Three of them finished in the 30s. And each time was the story. I'm not going to comment on the school because I'm sure it wouldn't happen in this one. But what I will say, parents, sometimes you've got to look them in the eyes and say, darling, I love you. I'm proud of you for trying so hard. But you're not always going to win. But you gave it everything. And on this day, you didn't quite get there. But you know what? You and I are going to work hard together. And next year, man, we will be there and we'll be there better than ever. Good on you, sweetheart. Because you're not prepared to do that and it's easier to try and put some pressure on external sources rather than look into those big eyes, those eyes that you want nothing more than to keep them happy and pain free for the rest of their lives, you start fighting for them. And then they come to me in the national team and you ring me up and say, little Johnny didn't make the Olympic team because he came fifth and he was a bit tired and I hang up. Because you have no influence. Once they get out of school, you know, they're in open competition, national selection, senior team, university or a job, you, have no, you can't bail them out. They may as well learn at a younger age that sometimes you lose, you've got to get up again and fight even harder for what you desperately want. And that's your job. So summarising that, confidence, which we know we can teach through unconditional love, acceptance and valuing. Commitment, we know you can parent. Easy way, hard way. Values is something you live and model every day and praise and respect those. And resilience, allow them to fail intelligently. Give them a path forward. Don't get them out of jail. Don't bail them out and show them that there's no such thing as failure. Mum and dad will get you out of trouble. We will get you off the hook. We will cover up your mistakes. We will cover up your inadequacies because we, you don't. That resilience just underpins because of this. I think it's a great point. When you've got a young child particularly who's really talented at eight, and you think at eight, nine, 10, they keep getting better, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, all blacks. So if you've got the best seven or eight year old football player, and because that for most people is that's what, what they know and understand is what's happening to their child. The real path that your child, if they've got talent, and if they're driven and if they're motivated and committed and that's their destiny, their path looks like this. That's the real path of high performance sport. That's what it looks like. When everything's going well in those up times, it's wonderful. You think they're going to continue forever. It's like interest rates being low and beautiful, wonderful, and you think it will continue forever. But when they go through these dips, and they'll all go through these dips, through injury or work commitments or fatigue or growth and development 
or a range of factors, a broken relationship, so many things can happen. When they go through that, who they are as a human being helps to sustain and drive them through those periods so they can continue on their way and make the most of their talent. And that's why this stuff's so important, parents, is that if all it was was physical talent and we saw that, then it would be a different lecture. It would be at eight, start a bit of strength training, nine to a bit more, start, and it would just be how do you get them physically better? But it's so much more than that because we know that they'll experience a whole range of ups and downs and emotions and challenges over their athletic lifetime. And that's when who they are and the character and values that you've instilled in them from a young age, that's when those things become so critically important and essential for where they need to go.